People always ask me a ton of questions about scarring. Why do scars form? How long do scars last? And is there anything that you can do to prevent scarring? Do you know how I got them? Well, you look nervous. Is it the scars? You wanna know how I got them? Well, let's just say I could have helped the Joker out. Let's go over the anatomical components of skin. The epidermis gives a protective waterproof layer and gives color, like one of those blue tarps that you can buy from the hardware store. The dermis provides most of the thickness and toughness of the skin, like the strong foundation of a building. And the basal layer continuously replicates, pushing dying keratin to the surface, like a skin factory. The epidermis allows for rapid cell migration to seal fresh wounds, but it also carries minimal strength. The dermis contains collagen and through extensive cross-linking, it provides intrinsic strength, like a braided rope. The process of laying down the collagen requires much more time than the rapid process of surface closure. As we get into the discussion of wound healing, think of the wound as if it were a natural disaster. First responders are immediately sent to the disaster site. The goal is to save lives, not look pretty or repair anything. The next phase is reconstruction. Volunteers and others come to start the rebuilding process. The goal is to fix what was broken. The final phase is beautification. However, you're left with signs of permanent damage, like a scar. Wound healing is divided into several phases. The first is inflammatory. Initially, there's platelet adhesion and aggregation. During this part, active substances are released, such as vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. There's initial vasoconstriction, followed by vasodilation. Reparative cells move in to begin the healing process. It's important to progress from this step as quickly as possible so that the wound may close and subsequent collagen deposition can begin. This process peaks within hours and lasts for about one week. At the end of this phase, the wound has about 10% of its final tensile strength. The next phase is the proliferative phase. The proliferative phase begins at 24 hours and it peaks at two to three weeks and lasts for months. This phase is characterized by epithelial regeneration, fibroplasia and collagen formation, wound contraction, and neovascularization. Epithelial regeneration is critical as it allows the reestablishment of the barrier to protect the underlying tissue from bacteria and other foreign material. A moist wound surface allows for better wound healing because the cells at the surface can migrate more easily. More on that later. Fibroblasts secrete collagen, which form into collagen fibers to help build strength. Contraction allows for wounds to close when needed, but it can lead to problems by mobile structures, such as the eyelid or the lip. The next phase of wound healing is maturation and remodeling. This lasts for about 12 to 18 months. The scar gradually becomes stronger and shows a decrease in size and redness. Collagen fibers become more organized. By the end of this phase, the scar has about 70 to 80% of the tensile strength of unwounded normal skin. Sometimes we don't have the best response team or immune system. This can lead to abnormal wound healing. Make sure to subscribe and turn on all notifications. Abnormal wound healing can be characterized in the following ways. You can have a contracted scar. That's when there's a replacement of the epidermis by thickened scar tissue. There could be a rolling scar, and that's when there's a depressed scar with irregular bands. There's also the potential for hypertrophic scars or an elevated appearance to the scar. Another type is an atrophic scar, which is when you have a thin epidermis. And also there's a keloid. A keloid is when there's overgrowth of the boundaries of the original injury. And this tissue then invades surrounding normal tissue. There are various factors that can impede normal wound healing. And some of these include diabetes, hypothyroidism, malnutrition, immunodeficiency, radiation exposure, retained foreign bodies such as suture or other foreign materials and tobacco use. And there are also many other factors that might 
make wound healing more challenging in an individual. So how do you optimize healing after surgery? It's important to control the underlying medical conditions as best as possible, and that's why I always take a full medical history prior to any surgery. It's also important to have great surgical technique. You have to reduce tension during closure, especially when it comes to controlling the epidermal healing. It's important to approximate the dermis and the epidermis separately when closing whenever possible. And also the suture selection is equally as important. For example, I only like to use non-dissolvable suture on skin. Now let's go through proper post-operative wound care. In the management of a surgical incision, you want to keep it clean. Reduce movements that involve the incision. It will heal better that way. Remove surface sutures at the appropriate time. So for example, on the face, you want to remove sutures at five to seven days post-op. And on the scalp, I usually wait seven to 14 days to remove those sutures. You want to keep the wound covered with ointment with a transition to scar gel. Now remember, moist wounds heal better than dry wounds. And that's because it allows epithelial cell migration to occur more directly. On the contrary, if you let the incision dry out and scab over, what that does to the underlying dermis is that it then becomes more desiccated and actually partially necrotic, and that impairs wound healing and leaves a worse scar. It's hard for the workers to rebuild in a desert. Now let's talk about the ointment to scar gel transition. So generally you want to apply antibiotic ointment for the first five to seven days, until the sutures are removed. And then you can switch over to aquaphor or a water-based gel for about three to five days. Or you can continue the antibiotic ointment, which is usually just fine. At around days 10 to 12, you test the incision with hydrogen peroxide. If there's fizzing from the peroxide, then continue the ointment for another day and then retest. Once there is no more fizzing, then you can switch to the scar gel which is applied as a thin coat twice a day. So how does scar gel work? The new immature stratum corneum, which is the outer layer of the epidermis, allows abnormally high levels of transepidermal water loss. This dehydration of the stratum corneum signals the keratinocytes to produce cytokines, which are signals to the fibroblasts to then synthesize and release collagen. The newly formed collagen rushes to the scar site. Silicone replicates the stratum corneum's occlusion properties, normalizing the hydration of the scar site to that of healthy skin, inhibiting the instruction sent to fibroblasts to produce excess collagen. So which scar gel is best? So we actually custom made our own silicone-based scar gel. We worked with a highly experienced chemist and we incorporated information from the world's literature on wound healing to arrive at our formulation. And this scar gel was specifically designed for the face, but of course works great on other parts of the body as well. We call it the Feel Confident Scar Gel. And it has this original blend of medical grade silicones of various molecular weights. It has several natural ingredients such as jojoba oil, calendula oil, sunflower seed oil. And these oils have all been associated with improving wound healing. We put links to the research studies in the description below. The benefits of this scar gel are that it applies as a matte finish, which is super important on the face where you don't want it to appear too glossy, especially if you're putting cover up or makeup over the scar gel. Also, it's very fast drying, which is important when you're applying it twice a day for many months. It has a smooth application, which I think people appreciate once they start using it. And the general instructions are to apply it morning and evening twice a day as a thin layer over the scar. And it can be used for up to 12 months to improve the scarring. And remember to protect the scar from the sun. So you would use an SPF of at least 50 over the scar gel. This scar gel is not white labeled. This is custom formulated with a lot of thought and research put into it. 
If you're interested in getting our scar gel, go to feelconfident.com. Now let's go over some frequently asked questions. Can I use silicone sheets instead? Sometimes, sure. However, they do not always conform to the exact dimensions of the incision, especially in areas that are curved. Also, they're usually very noticeable and cannot be easily concealed with makeup. And of course, they do not contain medicinal oils that have been associated with improved wound healing. How long should I use silicone gel or sheets for? Usually three to six months of silicone gel therapy is recommended. Some recommend up to 12 months for optimal results. As we reviewed previously, the remodeling phase can take a year or longer to complete. What should you do about the redness by the scar? Initially, this is due to inflammation and vasodilation, but this can linger for months as part of the neovascularization related to the proliferative stage of wound healing where new blood vessels are being made. My preference is for watchful waiting as it always goes away with time. Some people choose to reduce it sooner and that can be done with IPL or intense pulse light laser. But you should consider the expense related to that type of laser and also the frequency of visits that are needed to improve that redness sooner. What should be done if the scar appears to be elevated? My preference is for steroid injections, usually with Kenalog 10, at the first signs of elevation. And this can be repeated every four to six weeks until the scar is flattened. Other options could include surgical removal and revision, laser resurfacing, or microneedling. What do you do if the scar appears to be depressed or atrophic? My preference is to wait three months minimum and then consider a surgical revision. You have to be careful not to worsen this with microneedling or laser treatments. And definitely no steroids because that will make the area even more atrophic. What do you do if the scar appears to be too wide or cross-hatched? My preference is surgical revision. The root causes here are usually tension during closure, dehiscence of the wound, or a wound infection. These are all worthy of a surgical revision at least three months after the initial procedure. There needs to be a plan for how to prevent it from happening again. And I wouldn't waste time here with laser treatments or any other non-surgical modalities unless you have no other options. So for example, if you do a lip lift with maximal excision of skin, where you really can't lift anymore and you end up with unfavorable scarring, then you can consider something like laser treatments. But usually if it's a wide scar that's cross-hatched, the potential benefit of the laser is going to be limited. So when should a resurfacing laser or microneedling be introduced? A laser is best for narrow scars that are flat, to soften the scar line and to blend it in with the surrounding tissue. Some will laser every scar starting at four weeks after surgery. I think this is too early and often unnecessary, especially since the wound is in the early stages of healing. And the appropriate laser must be selected for each skin type. And microneedling is usually not my favorite treatment for any scar. There is less control in my opinion compared to laser resurfacing. If you want to improve your scarring and help support our efforts, please go to feelconfident.com to get your scar gel.